What's the connection between mindfulness and strong communication skills? We're going to find out right now. Our special guest today is Stan Cyrillis. He is the instructor and producer of an award-winning program, the Complete Mindfulness and Meditation Training Course found on Udemy. He's a world-renowned meditation a mindfulness expert. Meditation and mindfulness do go together a lot. He has trained everyone from the European Parliament to Merck to Accenture. He is an in-demand expert around the world. We're very happy that he's joining us today. Stan, how are you today? I'm good, TJ. Thank you for having me. Now, I'm interested in exploring the connection between mindfulness and communication, but let's just start from the very beginning and confession. I've read a lot of books on mindfulness. I've even conducted a course on mindfulness, but even I'm not sure exactly how to explain it to someone who's kind of heard this around and thinks maybe it's a buzzword. Let's just start at the beginning. How do you define mindfulness? Yeah, I think that's a very good question, TJ. And it, it's, it's sometimes, strangely enough, not that easy uh, to make it as simple as possible. But I think if there would be a one word definition for mindfulness, it would be awareness. Um, so awareness is something that we get when we pay attention to something. So in that sense, mindfulness training or the practice of mindfulness is the practice of paying attention to certain things so that we become more aware of them. And what we generally tend to do with mindfulness is pay more attention to our inner world. In other words, paying attention to the thoughts that are going through our mind, the emotions that we are experiencing, but also the various sensations that we feel uh, in the body. So those three elements are, you could say, the building blocks of, uh, of any experience that we ever have in this moment, thoughts, emotions, and sensations in the body. So with mindfulness, um, we are becoming more aware of this. Continued, you know, but I, I thought a, maybe you disappeared. That's a great, but let's use this as a learning moment. That's a great thing to think about when it comes to mindfulness, because I'm really, I'm trying to pay close attention to you. And I think I have, but I am in, in essence being less than completely mindful because I'm also orchestrating the, the camera move. So I had pushed a button. We're using a StreamYard software and I wanted to put you full screen. Yeah. So I, t I removed myself from stage. Yeah. That's very interesting, actually. It's a very different experience as well when the camera is just uh, on me and I don't hear you anymore. Yes. Yeah, so, and now I brought myself back. <laughs> so, yes. And I may have actually forgotten that when I do that, you can't hear my audio. So I may have said True. something and forgotten that. But this does, this is a perfect segue to the question for you is when people are doing public speaking and presenting, how can they be mindful, not only of their own feelings and sensations, but of their audience? Because I see all the time, people are so fixated on their script or their PowerPoint or their bullet points. Meanwhile, someone is in the audience with a confused look on their face, their hand up, hmm. and the speaker is completely oblivious they're not really in the moment of this shared experience with the audience. How do you help people with that? Yeah, I think in a way, communication is the master test for your mindfulness practice, because it's, it's a very complicated uh, thing that we're doing, right? Um, we're bringing our message across, but we're also, you know, not only trying to focus on ourselves, but also on the, the audience. And, you know, often there is an interaction with that audience and we're processing information and so on. So. I mean, there's a lot of elements that we could unpack from there. Um, I think the first thing is, that's important when you're speaking to an audience is with mindfulness, this ability to check in with yourself. How am I doing? So for example, when you pulled out just now and I was alone and I thought something had gone wrong in my, I noticed a lot of thoughts coming up. Should I continue? Should I stop? Should I wait? Uh -huh. Right. Um, but I could check. And that in was with my that. fault. I should have, I should have warned you at the beginning that I would be doing different things with the screen recording. Yeah, but that's and fine. So that it, was it, it, that's yeah, absolutely. But it's a good example of something happens. So how do I deal with this mindfully? So, okay, I'm trying to figure it out. And I decided to continue. Uh, but I could notice the emotions that were that were it was producing and, and things like that. But that was fine. I, I, I made a decision based on what was going on. 
And the point that you're making about your audience is very important as well, because for, of course, if we focus all our attention on ourselves, how am I doing? What, what should I be saying now? Then we can forget our audience. So with mindfulness, we're trying to direct the, our attention to all the elements that require attention, which is your message, how you're doing inside and whether you are feeling okay, but then also your audience. Um, what's going on with them? Can you get certain feedback from just the way that they're looking? Do, can you notice when they want to ask questions? So um, I think mindfulness can be quite helpful in managing this complex game of attention in such a situation. So in my world of training European members of parliament, for example, cross section with what you do, I really stress to people, that's why you do not want to be reading a script or a teleprompter with very few exceptions. And one of my clients won a Nobel Peace Prize and everyone's going to be studying that speech for years. So he really does have to sort of go off of text. Mm. If you are a prime minister, a president of a country, and every single thing you say could cause a scandal, you kind of got to follow the speech, the text, the teleprompter. But for the 99.9% .9 of business executives, no one's scrutinizing them to that level. And I've always believed it's far better off to really be focused on your audience, be mindful of your audience, their reactions. Are they looking at you with an, a, an eyebrow up? Are they nodding their head? Uh, worst case scenario, are they ignoring you and staring at their cell phone because you're so darn boring? So you've got to really be mindful of that audience, I think, in most cases. How do you get people to do that? Because there's a slight contradiction between focusing on them versus how am I feeling? How's my breath? What am I experiencing now? I think you make a good point. And um, one of the things that can get really lost when you're reading off a teleprompter or something like that, or everything's completely rehearsed, is authenticity. Um, it, it can become a message that doesn't come across because you're not really telling it. You're not really sharing a story. You're just reading words off a teleprompter. So that's on top of the fact that you might be connecting uh, less with your audience. I think many people will cling to teleprompters or learning everything by heart because they're stressed, right? They want to feel in control in the situation that they're in, which is somewhere where they need to perform. They do not want to have a blackout and not know what to say. So they will hold on for control with these kind of tools. So the message with mindfulness and in, co in combination with what you just said is, see if you can let go of this desire to control everything to the T and trust that when you need to say certain things, you will know what to say. And of course you prepare. Preparing is important. You need to have the talking heads, the talking points, but you want to find that balance between rehearsing or practicing and then still being spontaneous in the moment. And then really- tease this. Let's tease this out a little bit because I do have a slightly different perspective. I'm actually all in favor of control. The irony is of course, I think, the second you use a teleprompter or you try to memorize a speech, you've actually lost control because what happens to most people is their speed becomes consistent, their volume becomes consistent, their tone becomes consistent, and they've completely lost control of the experience for the audience because now everyone is bored out of their mind. So it's, I happen to think the desire for control is great. The things people are doing to try to create control are not helping them reach their goals. <laughs> what mm. you really do want, I think, is to control the experience for your audience mm. in such a way that you know before you even start that they're going to perceive you as comfortable, confident, relaxed, that they are going to understand your key messages, remember your messages, and act upon them. Now, in order to do that, you may have to go in different ways. You may have to answer a question in the middle of the presentation. You may have to look at someone's confused look and then give another example. So how you're actually speaking and what you're saying in the presentation may have to change on a dime in the middle of it if the goal is actual control on the experience for the audience, kind of my perspective. I, I completely follow that perspective. I think preparation is very important. And exactly, 
I like how you said you want to control the experience for your audience. And in a way that also re means that you need to let go a little bit of the control of having everything in a very rigid structure. Um, if that helps you connect with your audience. And I think really with mindfulness, we're usually working on letting go a little bit of that, that obsessive control to have, to make sure nothing can go wrong. Right. We need to be able to flow a little bit in the communication that we're doing. Uh, definitely in the flow, a key concept. And in my mind, that's what does connect to mindfulness is you have to be in the flow. You have to be in the moment because it's really easy for audience members to notice someone who's essentially reading a teleprompter off their brain. If they're thinking about, here's what I'm going to say in the next sentence, and here's what I'm going to say five seconds from now in order to sound important, you don't feel like the speaker's even present. And it's not that they're reading a script or reading bullet points, but you can just tell they're thinking about what they're going to say. They're not actually having a conversation with us now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we could also look at maybe more like, obviously we have speaking, public speaking, but if we look at like an everyday conversation that you have with anyone, um, obviously there as well, you might not have as much this teleprompter necessity, um, but, but also oh, there. <laughs> that would be kind of weird to be at breakfast with your kids or your spouse and reading a yeah. teleprompter saying, good morning, dear, how are you? <laughs> that would be really weird. You you work with Parliament. I just have to give a, a little aside. Ronald Reagan, the former president of the United States, was notorious for being in a meeting sometimes with two people reading off of cue cards the whole time. <laughs> he was so wow. enamored. Now, he could do it in a way where he came across fairly well, but he was really beholden to cue cards. Nice anecdote. I think Joe Biden has a lot of cue cards as well from, from what I've been from what I've been told. Um, yeah, um, well, just to give one example of this need or this desire to control even in one-on-one in -on -one conversations, I suffered a lot from anxiety. And this was growing up when I was young, when I was just a child, but also at university. And for me, mindfulness in that regard, really, it, it helped a lot in sort of breaking through this, this cycle of anxiety, worrying, living inside of my head. And one of the ways that this would manifest is that because I, I felt it most strongly in social situations. So it was a social anxiety. So I remember going to meet someone that I knew from law school and on the bike right there, I was preparing in my head what I was going to say to him what he could respond and what I would respond next. So I was living in the future. I was worrying about the future. I tried to have full control over something that really needs to flow in the moment, right? So that's for me where um, looking back on that, I learned, yeah, anxiety and stress really can make us give up our authenticity or our being in the moment just because we want to feel safe. And I think that's something that is very useful to work on with communicators is how can they get that inner sense of feeling okay, feeling safe in a situation so that they then can, you know, really bring out their best. One of the easiest ways to spot an amateur talk show host or interviewer or reporter is they're either staring at questions the whole time or they've memorized questions. Meanwhile, the person they're interviewing, whether it's a politician or a celebrity, has said something incredibly interesting. They've dropped a bomb and the reporter's not even following up on it because they're they're just following a prescribed list of questions they thought it had. They're not in the moment. They asked the question, now they're thinking about what's the next question. To be a great interviewer, for that matter, to be a good conversationalist, you could argue even to be a good friend, you have to be in the moment really listening to the person you're talking to, whether it's one friend or family member at the kitchen table, or you're in a TV studio and 10 million people are there with you watching, you've got to really listen and be in the moment. Yep, absolutely. Um, and finding that balance between, and this is, is one of the practices in mindfulness as well, when we apply it to communication is like, uh, we call it 50-50. So placing 50% of your attention with yourself and 50% with the other person. It doesn't really, it's hard to do that at the same time because usually we can only pay attention to one thing at a time, right? So we usually will switch attention to the other person and then towards ourselves. But it's useful to switch in between. One, by of course, we want to listen and be in touch with what the other person is saying. 
But at the same time, if somebody says something and we get upset, then we really want to have that ability to check with ourselves and say, oh, wow, I'm now I'm getting angry. What do I want to do now, now that I noticed this? So it's always this management of you're, in, you're, you're listening or interacting with the other person and checking in with yourself. Uh, great point, Stan. Walk us through your approach when you're working with members of parliament, highly paid, busy executives at, at Merck and Accenture. A lot of them may have a preconception about, eh, this is this mindfulness is mumbo jumbo. It's kind of a waste of time. How do you come in, work with them and help them see immediate improvement in their quality of life, their productivity, their stress levels, whatever it is you're doing to help them? Very good point uh, that you make. And also about the fact that professionals might not, or people working at you know big companies and, and, and big, uh, have a lot of responsibility. Sometimes they do have some sort of resistance to mindfulness or they have an image of mindfulness as being something that is sort of spiritual or wishy-washy, you know, meditating cross-legged. So I think what I've noticed is that one of the most important things to do is to translate mindfulness into a solid, rational framework, right? Where you make the minds of those people understand that, first of all, there is a framework that makes sense. There is research behind it. And we're using terminology that they can relate to. So instead of saying, paying attention to the present moment, I will speak of attention management, right? We're managing our attention and we're choosing to direct it at, what it at what's important to us. So what I've noticed is that really helps a lot. But even then, um, certain practices that might work quite well on a general audience might not work so well with high level professionals. For example, one of the typical starter level or, or, or the first practices that we do in a mindfulness training is mindful eating. And it's a very useful practice, but it can be challenging if you have, uh, you know, let's say several board members of a high uh, company, they might see that as funny that you're doing something so trivial that appears trivial to them to mindfully eat, let's say a biscuit or something. That so, is interesting to me that you, you talk about that with Europeans, because every time I go to Europe um, and I just spent a month there in Paris this summer, I'm always aware of the fact that compared to Americans, it seems like all Europeans are thin, slim, in good shape, and eat mindfully. Because you, if you if you're in Paris or in in Brussels, and you see somebody walking down the street, slurping ice cream down, eating a piece of pizza, pretty much you know it's an American. It's not a local <laughs> because <laughs> the European mentality does seem to really respect food and eating and eating in a mindful way and valuing quality over quantity. And I was reminded as recently as yesterday, I'm at a fancy resort down the street from me on the beach, expensive place for food. And my egg sandwich is about 10,000 degrees because it's been over microwaved. You can't get a microwaved egg sandwich in Paris unless you're, <laughs> unless you're at an American uh, chain restaurant. So I'm intrigued by the fact that you need to even talk about that with Europeans. Tell us how that goes. Well, I, I don't want to make big statements about the difference between Americans and Europeans in terms of diet, although I, I do think there are differences. I think, you know, just the fast food culture is even stronger in the United States. But I mean, a similar thing does is happening in Europe. We also have, you know, problems with food. Um, but I think most people, and, and there's actually research from the University of Harvard that suggests that people spend about half percent, uh, sorry, 50% of their waking hours thinking about something different than what they're actually doing in the moment. And that includes eating. So I, I think definitely when we're eating, most people will spend at least half the time of the time that, time that they're eating thinking about other things that they still need to do, things that have happened, analyzing certain things in their minds. So it is important to see if we can find this moment again, this experience that we're having through the senses of eating, because the same research from Harvard also suggests that people report being less happy when they are not paying attention to the activity that they're doing than when they are actually paying attention to that activity. So, it's definitely something that's still needed uh, that's that's needed in Europe as well.
Sam, let's give people a quick practical tip on how they can use mindfulness based on what you and I are doing right now. I'm listening to you very carefully right now, but I'm not actually looking at you. I'm not seeing every nuance of your face because if I were looking at you, I would look like this. Hmm. I'm now looking at you clearly, but for the sake of people watching us on YouTube and other video platforms, I don't want to do like this because to them, it may look like, oh, geez, he's checking his Facebook or he's checking his email. Mm. So I'm looking, I'm purposely looking at the camera and it's uh. something I've been doing for decades, but for a lot of people, it still feels really weird. So you get this kind of look. Mm. What's your advice to people on how to balance the, the thing that helps them focus the most versus if they are trying to communicate to other people, how to communicate effectively? Because I'm, I'm doing not what's most comfortable to me. I'm what I'm doing right now is trying to do what's comfortable for the audience mm. by looking at the camera. That's actually interesting. Just to come back to it, the point that you're saying, you're, so it means your your screen is on a different place than where your camera is. With me, the camera is right above my screen. But you know, okay. usually in these Zoom meetings, I'm yeah. I, if I, now I'm looking at you because I'm looking in the camera. Now I'm looking at my screen, but. That is a shame, right? That that cannot be one-on-one -on -one the same. At the same time, I feel for Zoom meetings, that's really uh, comfortable. But if, like you said, if you're trying to really speak to your audience, then actually I could, it would be probably more useful to look in the camera that way. Um, but I mean, if we're looking at tips for balancing um, your attention with your audience and with yourself, I mean, usually I, I I really start with building up mindfulness foundations of paying attention to your personal experience. Um, I think the 50-50 practice is, is usually quite useful. So shifting, switching between, okay, uh, paying attention to the other person, paying attention to yourself. And usually when it's just about listening, then it's about 100% listening. So now I'm 100% speaking, checking in with myself from time to time. When you're speaking, I'm usually staying with what you're saying almost all the time. Because once you let your attention, you know, drift off to anything else, then you will miss part of the message. So I, I, I would see it as a certain, you know, it's useful as a tip maybe to see it as a percentage and to decide for yourself, what is the optimal percentage for me to pay attention to the other person or to pay attention to me or pay attention to, in, in your case, the buttons that you're controlling on the podcast. And just to make conscious decisions about what's, what's the best uh, approach here. See, I'll give you a little warning. In just a moment, uh, we're going to check out your course on Udemy on mindfulness. I'm going to ask you to give us live your best 30 to 60 second pitch because your course, like all courses, have a preview video, a promo video to sell. Mm -hmm. But my, my students, my visitors to the TJ Walker Success Channel are often trying to focus on how they can pitch their product, their service, their cause more effectively. So we're always interested in hearing people's pitches and then sort of just dissecting what do they do? What do we like? What can we learn from that? So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to do that. We'll go ahead and pull up your course. And I see that has a 4.7 rating out of five with nearly a thousand reviews, many thousand students. And I've been on Udemy long enough to know you don't get that unless it's a great course. Mm. Full disclosure, yeah, I haven't taken the course yet, but I do know enough about the Udemy ecosystem that you can't fake that. If someone has a course that has a 5.0 rating, but there's only two reviews, doesn't mean anything other than the fact that it wasn't promoted well. But when you've got nearly a thousand ratings and a 4.7 review, that says to me, your students really see what you're doing is, is highly outstanding. So we're going to go to this in just a moment. So I want you mm -hmm. to get, get ready and be prepared for that. And while we're giving him just a second to think, I'll do my own plug. If you are thinking of doing interviews like this, speeches, you want to improve your own Zoom performance, you have to give live in-person speeches or presentations, and you want to learn a lot faster than the trial and error process that I did my first 15 years, you may want to consider joining our high stakes presenter program. There's a free training. I'll link to it in the description below. Highstakespresenter.com. Absolutely free video training, uh, sort of a mini course 
that will teach you tips on how to learn much faster. It took me about 15 years to become a good presenter. Now, I started when I was 12, <laughs> about to graduate from sixth grade. If you want to spend 15 years, you can do it the long, tedious way I did, or you could do it much faster. Okay, Stan, we've pulled up your course here, mm. the Complete Mindfulness and Meditation Training. I want you to imagine that I'm a typical Udemy student. I've just typed in mindfulness. This comes up and so do about 10,000 other courses. I'm willing to push the preview course, the video. I'm willing to push one button to learn about you for 60 seconds. Now, what do you want me to hear? Yeah, thank you. So I, I would say there's at least two main reasons that I could give you for taking this course. And I think the first one is that it really is one of the most, if not the most comprehensive mindfulness and meditation course on Udemy and perhaps out there. So what, what I try to do is really bring all my experience uh, that I've had as a mindfulness trainer over the years and package it into one course. And I've combined elements from the main mindfulness programs, mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, but also added elements of positive psychology, happiness research, and even made the link between Western mindfulness and mindfulness in the Eastern wisdom tradition. So it's a quite a complete uh, course that you get that way. And you will be learning uh, from me personally as a trainer with over five years of experience um, and teaching too many uh, in many interesting or too many high-end corporations. Good, a lot of good stuff there. What is the number one benefit that I will instantly experience in my life after taking this course? I would say the main benefit is that you will feel more uh, present in your own life, more connected to the present moment, and you will have cre built or created more self-awareness, which will help you to reduce stress, to communicate more mindfully and so on. Great, a lot of good stuff there. Stan. And one question I have, I like the fact that you say complete in the title because I've experienced you myself <laughs> in, the, in the Udemy ecosystem where every course is basically the same price. I, I give the analogy of it's kind of like you're out late at night on a Saturday night with your friends. Everyone's hungry. There's two restaurants across the street from each other. They're each $20 for the buffet. One of them has seven entrees and two desserts. One of them has 200 entrees and 300 desserts. They're both the same price. Which restaurant are you going to? You're probably going to go to the one that has all the other choices. Now, you're never going to eat 200 entrees, but it just seems like a better value. So that's why I kind of came up with, in following others, it wasn't my original idea of naming courses complete and making them longer because they tend to do better on Udemy. Other platforms, it can be different. People want a mm -hmm. short period of time. My only question about your, your title is I'm seeing parentheses MBCT slash MBSR. I have no idea what those things mean. And as a general principle, I would just, and you may have a great reason for putting it there. My only bit of feedback would be if you're doing a title to attract your ideal audience, are you make certain you're only using words and symbols that instantly are understandable to them. I have no idea what it is. So you want to fill this in? That's a good point, actually. And let's say that that's the part of the title that I've changed the most. Um, <laughs> basically, MBCT and MBSR refers, refers to the two main mindfulness protocols out there, mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. I think the main reason why for now I've kept it in is, is because I've noticed that about 4% of people that come and, and subscribe to the course do find it by typing in MBCT or MBSR in the search bar. Um, okay, so that's a I great reason. Your, yeah, but I do also get your point that and I've, I've thought about um, putting something different in the title, maybe putting MBCT, MBSR in the subtitle, but for now I've, I've kept it. So. What I really like about your answer is it wasn't just your gut. You looked at data. And we live in a world now where if you want to be a communicator, you have so much great, rich data to draw from to tell you 
what's the what's the connection between what you really want to talk about and what your audience wants to talk about and how can you find the intersection mm. because it's all wonderful to say you know be authentic and just say what you want to say but sometimes you do that and it turns out nobody else in the world cares what you have to say <laughs> i experienced that early in my career as a political talk show host people ju it just didn't resonate i failed miserably i once talked on a late night talk show in Miami Beach from midnight to 4 a.m. Didn't get a single call. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to talk about did not resonate with whatever audience was there. So I'm really glad that you're looking at data and, and tweaking. Certainly when you're talking about promoting a product that you put time, energy, and effort in creating, whether it's an online course, whether it's a book, looking at the data is essential. Mm. Uh, many of our viewers and i'm sure a lot of your friends have read the book the four hour work week well yep. that wasn't just something that came out of tim ferris's head as an epiphany it wasn't what a big shot editor at a new york city publishing house came up with tim ferris to his credit tested dozens of titles and other titles i think his favorite title was you know confessions of a drug lord <laughs> and mm -hmm. how to be an outlaw they had all these titles and the title, The 4-Hour Workweek, went through the roof, much more popular. And because of listening to data, he was able to create an entire fantastic career. Mm. That book has sold millions and millions and millions and millions of copies. In part, there's a lot of interesting ideas in there. But part of it, it's the best title ever <laughs> for a book <laughs> in that genre. So I'm very happy. So. Folks interested in mindfulness, they can go to the Udemy platform. It's too e it's too small to see here, but it's letter U D E M Y dot com. It's a little hard to see. It's in, in full disclosure. I have a couple hundred courses there as well. It's an open platform. So any of our viewers can also post their courses there. But you can see it right there. And again, the name of it is the complete mindfulness and meditation training. It's on sale today, normally $79, it's 80% off. And I think you can quite frequently find a, a very good price for this course. So thanks so much for, for sharing that with us, Dan. We wish you continued good luck with that course. Thank How you. How did you, take us through your journey. I mean, you, you're you even more traditional than I was. I mean, I started off the route of, you know, go to an elite university, get accepted to, a top 20 law firm where I sort of exited that ramp was I decided not to go to law school at all, but you have a master's degree an advanced degree in law. How did you go from sort of a straightforward, traditional linear career, the type of career that pleases most parents into this mindfulness world? How did you get? Uh, thanks. That's, that's a great question. And um, I think I used, I, I think I can answer that by saying a combination of passion, uh, and personal struggle. So I, I told you a little bit about um, the anxiety that I struggled with when I was growing up and also as a student, as a law student. So my studies were going great. I had everything under control, you can say. Uh, but on the inside, you know, I felt quite insecure. I had a lot of anxiety. I felt tired all the time. And it was towards the end of my studies that I really started talking about this uh, with other people. And one of my best friends at the time, actually invited me to do a mindfulness training to, together. So it was in our university, in a university town, we went to do it. And from the start, I felt like, wow, there was a click with mindfulness. First of all, I noticed I'm not the only person on the planet that has, you know, struggles with stress or anxiety or overthinking. Uh, but also the tools seem to be quite useful. So I, actually, since that day, it's been over 10 years ago, um, I've been practicing with mindfulness constantly. Maybe not always meditating, but applying these principles of mindfulness, looking at your experience and processing your stress and emotions. So um, I finished my studies and then a second thing happened that kind of got me off track or off the, the beaten track, you could say, is that my brother invited me to go travel together. So right after my studies, I started traveling with my brother and what started off as six, an idea for six months ended up being five years abroad. 
Um, That's a lot of travel. <laughs> yeah, traveling, working abroad, living abroad. I also met uh, a, a girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend now. So I also lived a year in Mexico. So and throughout this process of traveling, now, forgive me, forgive me yeah. for interrupting. This was roughly ten years ago. So this is this is prior to a lot of people really embracing the idea of being the digital nomad. Am true. I getting the time frame correct? True, true. This so is, how did this you support yourself? What's what sort yeah. of work did you do to support yourself? Because a lot of people are watching this thing. Wow, that would be great. But especially ten years ago, how do yeah. you do that without rich, generous parents? Well, uh, I guess if you want to sustain it, you need to work, right? And I think usually for young people, one of the places that I can recommend, obviously, is uh, Australia or New Zealand. These are typical backpacker. Uh, friendly places where you can do work and make a living as well. So we got very fortunate in Australia. My brother and I, we worked for a year in the photography sector, actually, where we did photo shoots for kids. Um, and that actually we we did quite well. We we were promoters, but we also assisted the photo shoots. And we had a great year. We became trainers and, and you know, that, that was all great. But after the, that year, we had to leave Australia. So that was enough money that I saved to travel another year. Um, and basically that's how I continued over the years, working at times, at other times not working. And when traveling, traveling to, you know, let's say the more affordable places in the world, places like South America or, or Asia. Um, and then I did spend a year in Mexico City, um, living there as well. And that's really where I started doing more and more mindfulness trainings, focusing on that. And that's where I also created this and first mind. I want to make course. sure I'm getting the. I want to make sure I'm getting the career path straight. You you got a degree, a college degree, a law degree, but you then supported yourself with your photography skills. Is that am I am I understanding it correctly? The career path. Yes. No. The career path is finishing my studies and then going traveling, which is adventure time, right? And yeah. along that path of adventure time, photography at that time was a good opportunity that came uh, to learn a lot of different things, but it wasn't part of my career trajectory. It was more part of the experience of living and working abroad. Um, so but that paid it, the bills that paid for the yes. food and the rent. Great. Yes, exactly. So to bring it back on the career trajectory along the way, I realized I want to do more with mindfulness. I, I don't necessarily want to become a lawyer. So I started teaching by myself. Um, I, I, I started uh, doing trainings in Mexico. I recorded the mindfulness training in Mexico. And then when I came back to Belgium, um, I got the opportunity to work for a mindfulness organization in Belgium that does trainings and teacher trainings and in-company trainings. I worked there uh, for five years as a manager and a mindfulness trainer. Now I'm working for a Dutch organization that does it's a very similar uh, business, you could say, mindfulness and mindfulness related trainings and teacher training. Um, and then now I'm focusing more on also creating more courses for myself and more on, you know, online presence and, and, and creating new Udemy courses and so on. OK, great. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to give us another pitch, because, again, the, the audience of the TJ Walker Success Channel, they're giving pitches themselves. They like to study pitches. We like to learn the, the best. In, by the way, much better with the light. Yeah, <laughs> the it's getting dark much here. Much better. <laughs> I, shame on me for not having mentioned that at the beginning. So here's what I really want to know. Let's say I am, I'm the head of training leadership development for IBM Europe. You're now the representative of your big mindfulness training company. And I've agreed to meet with you. I want to hear how you pitch, because if I'm if I'm head of leadership development and training for IBM in Europe, I'm getting inundated every single day. I open my email in the morning. There's a thousand emails from training companies. My phone is getting calls. I'm getting nice, slick mailers all the I'm overwhelmed. But now I'm giving you a couple of minutes to, to pitch your wares, so to speak. I want to hear because in my own mind, I don't really know. I know how to pitch public speaking training and media training to someone like that, because that's what I've done for decades. But I'm just really curious as to how you pitch a really busy learning and development director on mindfulness skills at the corporate level. 
So let's right. hear it. Absolutely. Now, most of my pitch would consist of questions. So if I do get uh, a chance to have meetings, usually in, w within our organizations, we do have many organizations coming to us, many companies coming to us. And then it's most uh, mostly about listening to what's happening in the company, what's happening, for example, in leadership, if it's a leadership training or what's happening if, at the employee level. So what are the things that the employees, for example, are struggling with? What are the stress factors at this moment at IBM, right? Is there, th there are often maybe um, many changes within the organization or certain expansions or restructurings. Um, there might be things like, you know, having very tight deadlines, um, too much, too high of a workload. So I'm, I usually, tr we, we try to map out what's the situation and it, you know, of course, if there is high, if there are high levels of stress, then we can then pitch why mindfulness can be helpful to reduce that stress and to help uh, employees, for example, to manage it all and to process for example, the difficult experiences that they might have when they are quite stressed. So um, that's how I would approach it. So I haven't really pitched it to you, but I wanted to give you at least Let a little make understanding. Up. Yeah. Let me make up a hypothetical problem. And in full disclosure, I should say IBM is not a client, current client of mine. I maybe trained someone from there 30 years ago, but I'm just making this up. But what if I say to you, look, we have a real problem with our, our company culture in that all of our meetings end up going for two hours long. Everyone's on their cell phone the whole time. I can't tell people to get off of it because our CEO and all of our C-level executives, the whole time they're in meetings, they're multitasking, they're sending texts, they're reading email. They're like, oh, I just got a message on, on uh, WhatsApp. Oh, what's going on there? So how do you change a culture like that when from the top down, everybody's mind is in two or three places at once. Yeah, absolutely. That, that would be a very good question. And I think, especially the example of smartphones that you gave, it's, it's quite difficult to have meetings where everyone has their full attention, if at the same time they are constantly being distracted by smartphones. So I think what I would recommend is if that is the culture, um, to see if there could be, you know, some investment in mindfulness related training where we look with employees at how they can manage their attention optimally, um, whether that's in meetings, but also outside of meetings. So what we want to create is a situation where rather than constantly being pulled, attention being pulled in all kinds of directions by, let's say, external circumstances that everyone working at IBM, for example, can consciously choose what they pay attention to in the moment and also to create a culture where if there are meetings, for example, where maybe smartphones are put aside, uh, where, where perhaps we can do, you know, simple mindfulness practices to get everyone present in that meeting before we start and to then see what the effects would be on meetings and also on the relationships between colleagues when there is an actual, you Let's know, Present. Let's. I'd like to scratch a little deeper there. Do you have ex success in getting companies to actually change a policy and to really do the put your cell phone in a box before you come into the room? Because that fascinates me. I would love to see that, but I'm I'm skeptical about how often you're able to make that happen. Do you have any stories or examples of that? Well, at the end of the day, it's up to the company, right? And as mindfulness trainers, as external trainers, what we give, what we can give is advice. What we can give is to, what we can tell is what works uh, in terms of attention, in terms of attention management, in terms of well-being. And what I've noticed is that um, especially when management or management levels are present and enjoying the mindfulness training, they will be more likely to then also execute certain things. And I haven't, I have never really given the suggestion that people should put all their phones in a box, but at least to really take a moment at the beginning of a meeting to say, Hey, can we all agree to put the phone, you know, on silent mode or on airplane mode for the duration of the meeting? And you do see that certain organizations pick up on that. And then if they see the positive results, then that reinforces, of course, uh, the, the behavior. Another example would be, you know, short 
meditation or, or mindfulness practices, practices right before starting the meeting. One minute of paying conscious attention to your breath, one minute of checking in to see what your current mood or stress, stress or energy levels are before starting. Uh, we also get a lot of good feedback about that. So that's specifically with, with meetings, two of the things that, that generally do tend to be helpful. Dan, switching gears, are you, and by the way, this is a perfect moment to point out, if you're getting any value out of this video, please do several things. Like the video, subscribe to this channel, sign up for notifications, share it on another platform. Just hit a one button, share it to Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever you like to be. Also post a comment or question in the comments section, because Stan has told me He's going to look at them and he'll answer them for you. Right, Stan? That's no problem, yeah. right? So sure. feel free to post your questions, even though we're not live now. And Stan should get back to you or, or give you another resource. Or if it's a question to me, I will get back to you and respond to you in the comments section as well. Stan, switching gears, I want to know what your philosophy is about mindfulness apps, because there's a lot of them out there. And there's one school of thought that says the last thing people need <laughs> in a busy, cluttered world and a stress-free world is yet another excuse to pick up their phone. And, but there's another school of thought that says, no, no, if you've got a meditation app or a mindfulness app, it can be very helpful if you just do that one thing and everything else is off. I know personally, I do a, a daily meditation where it's just the audio record app because I've recorded myself doing a self-guided meditation for 10 minutes. And I just listened to that with my eyes closed and earpieces in. And I've been doing that for about five years. I like it, but that's about as low tech as you can possibly get without turning mm -hmm. your phone off. So what are your thoughts on meditation and mindfulness apps i think they're great i think um yeah it's something that you also mentioned in your course i think on mindfulness is that it's a it's a two-edged sword right a smartphone is both at the same time the greatest source of distraction especially social media uh, and on the other hand it's the greatest tool right you can use it with all these valuable apps there are many valuable meditation apps out there um, there are other apps on, um, you know, positive affirmations or relaxation. So there's, it's about finding ways to leverage the technology without it um, dominating your life and without it, you know, so in other words, making conscious choices to pay attention to certain things that are useful on the smartphone without getting lost in the, let's say, addictive uh, doom scrolling behaviors that you know many of us do get lost in often. So I'm I'm a fan of, of apps. Um, I think whether you do a course on Udemy or or practice it through an app, um, whatever works, and as long as it's uh, used in a positive way. I, and I guess it, it could be done. It could be positive, but then again, if you're getting notifications five times a day, hey, you didn't do your mindfulness. Tech, uh, exercise to take that can create stress. I mean, one of the things I do teach in my all of my personal development courses is don't allow notifications on mm -hmm. your phone, and life will be a lot less stressful. Yeah, full disclosure: you mentioned affirm. I do have an affirmation slash habits app that I'd love for people to check out. It's called Ultimize. You can see a link to that in the About Us section of my YouTube channel. So, but it's ultimize, U-L-T-A-M-I-Z-E.com. If you could check that out, it's sort of the, the next generation of all the themes I worked on in my mindfulness course and other courses in personal development. Now, Stan, let me ask you a personal question. What do you do when you're with friends or family members or and I have no idea if you're married or not. I don't, I don't even want to know. I'm not asking. But if let's say you're on a back in the day when you're on a date or you have friends who are single and you're trying to have a meal, you're having a conversation, you're having a glass of wine and someone just starts doing it. How do you react? I know personally it annoys me. I mean, with, if I'm having dinner with my wife and daughter, I say, no, we're not going to do that. 
put and I don't even give my daughter access to a phone.、Mm-hmm. But I try to keep them away at, at dinner time, meal time. But how do you do that with friends? I mean, you're a lot younger than I am, so you must、mm-hmm. have. If you're not single, you must have friends who are single. What's the protocol now for engaging and having to tolerate someone not being mindful to the conversation, but instead giving all their attention to a cell phone when there's、yeah. a human being right there? Um, I, I, I'm, I, I think I'm definitely younger than you,、uh, TJ. But I'm also <laughs> not the, I'm also not the youngest. So I'm, I'm 35. So I would be millennial, right? And we have the Generation Z、uh, generation after us. And I think generation between generations, it really changes, right? I think for me, and I would say most of my friends, we really don't appreciate it. If especially if we're with someone one on one and they're they're checking their phone all the time. I mean. Checking it for a second to to see to check the time that's fine, but usually if if I would have a friend that's constantly checking the phone, I would ask him, hey, you know, what's going on? Like, is there something important that that you're that you're that you need to check your phone for? And you know, I have a friend that n- usually never does that, and last time he was doing it, and he said, oh yeah, my my friend is、uh, like she's checking up on me, blah blah blah. And then I'm I'm okay, you know, if if for he, for him that's not needed in that moment, then it's not something he does always. That's fine. If people have the tendency to always just spend more time paying attention to the phone than to me, then then I will object. Or you know, I, I don't think that's good for for relationships.、Um, I think it gets in the way. Have you? Here's the big question: Have you ever ended a friendship? Maybe you didn't tell the person, but you've decided I, I'm not going to call that person to get together for lunch or dinner anymore. They're Spending all their time on their phone. Have you ever ended a relationship over that essentially lack of mindfulness? I don't think so. But、uh, let's say that if I would go on a first date with someone and that would happen, it would be a huge red flag.、Um, you know, to, to have someone who's constantly on their phone, it just means that either they find their phone more important in that time, or they feel so uncomfortable that they need to escape to the phone that they're really not comfortable with this one-on-one interaction. I mean, there can be other reasons, but. Um, I, I usually would be curious to to explore like why that's happening, but、um, if there's not a, I mean, if there's not a good explanation, then for me that that does become a problem. Yeah, I can't even imagine. You, I, today's my eleventh. Today's my eleventh wedding anniversary. So I'm、oh, wow. so old. These all these tinders and things of swiping weren't even around when I was really single. So I can't imagine how annoying. That would be because if someone's on a date and they're they're swiping other date options in front of you, <laughs> that just、yeah. and I've heard of that happening. Hey, Stan, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to、mm. give you the last couple of minutes to give our audience some tips on if they've never done anything to do with mindfulness, how can they sort of put their toe in the water? How can they get started in two areas? One with general mindfulness. Two. With how they can be more mindful with their communication. I think when we're looking at mindfulness in general,、um, it really depends on your level of curiosity about the subject. So, if you're someone who has been, you know, hearing about mindfulness and you think it could be useful to you and you want to invest some time in it, then you know, doing a course, for example, on Udemy or even a live mindfulness training,、um, that's just a great way to lay the foundations, right? And usually,、um, I would say that if you do it live in a group, that's even better. But these online trainings, such as the trainings that you and I have on Udemy, they're quite good as well already. So I think those are nice introductions.、Um, and if you would like to get maybe more of a tease,、um, then I, I think there's certain meditation apps where you can also get some free trials and, and learn something. Um, I, I will also be、um, uh, creating shorter courses、uh, on certain specific topics around mindfulness in the coming months. Whether that's you know mindfulness for a busy professional or mindfulness for stress management or for self care,、um, there's a few themes that I will also be publishing. So yeah, I think if it is interesting, just finding certain first ways in, and I think doing a course or a training generally、um, will be quite helpful. Great. Well, Stan, thanks so much for being our guest today. We're going to link to your Udemy course in our description below. And is there any place else where you would like people to reach out to you and find you? Well, I think、uh, anyone can reach me on LinkedIn as well.、Um, so that's Stan Cerullis. If、uh, yeah, I see my name there on the screen. 
um, you can reach yeah, there we'll, as well. We'll post and link I could, to that. Yes, and I could share my uh, my email address as well if that's uh, useful. So maybe uh, I can share it with you, TJ, or you have it already. I sure. Yeah. Sure, we can post we can post that in the link as well. Stan, thanks so much for being our guest today. I want to thank everyone for watching. And again, check out Stan's course. By the way, if you don't if you haven't been to Udemy before, they do a fantastic job of letting you really preview a course. I can watch the entire course overview. Let's just let's just share with people for one minute so they know what we're talking about. Here I'm on his course page where it's blue. I can click that and I can actually watch it. So you don't have to just, you don't have to just take someone's word for it. You don't have to just take a blind jump. You can actually experience the instructor. We can learn it's all about habits. Another lecture, anywhere where it's blue and highlighted, we can learn about the dog and his owner for one of your examples. Our inner experience, all of these things you can preview how to reduce stress mindfully. All of these are available. How to deal with difficult emotions. All of those are completely available without you having to make that final decision to make the purchase. So that's kind of the beauty of Udemy and one of the reasons why they are the number one course marketplace is they make it really easy for students to feel comfortable before pulling out their credit card is you can, you can check you can see if you like the person's approach. So a lot of people obviously love your approach, Stan, because you've got thousands and thousands of students, almost a thousand reviews and an extraordinarily high rating. So people obviously like a certain number of people like listening to you. A certain number of people really like listening to me, but other people say, oh, I don't want to look at this guy with bad hair and beady eyes i mean i've had people leave all sorts of comments i, I love the way how play. you present actually on on your I, I'm, I'm just checking the your mindfulness course and just the way that you tend to speak like you, you can see the communication experience that's there so it's a lot of fun to listen to actually and you do cover a lot of uh, di different topics as well so yeah I, I enjoy it well thanks thanks so much and i'm looking forward to your course as well Stan, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.